Hotel is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. We get a lot of people down at God Tell who have spiritual problems, obviously, sometimes emotional problems, sometimes mental problems, sometimes just financial problems. But God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's the people that work for God Tell School. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, and all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on at God Tell. God is a God of miracles, and that's what you're seeing down at God Tell. You're seeing God perform some things in a very subtle, quiet way, and yet a job gets done that outside of the supernatural would not get done. Good morning. Is this everybody? Everybody that is somebody? <laughs> Still waiting on one minute. Oh, your son? Mm-hmm. Tell him he's very strong because he's holding all of us up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a dead joke. Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> well, we will be in uh, Luke chapter... 15 this morning. Use the force, Luke. Luke. So I see some new faces since the last time I was here. What's your name? Either one. Oscar. Philip. Okay. No, was it? John Briscoe. John Briscoe. Okay. Chris Cole. Chris. All right. John. All right. My name's Michael. How you doing? I think I met everybody else. This is my wife and some of the children. My oldest son. My youngest son. My girls. <laughs> My brother, <laughs> I live in a uh, I live in Spring, and uh, I come when I can. Uh, our father started this ministry years ago, so um, I wished I could come more often, but I I work a lot. So, um, but then again, I like to work a lot too. So it's kind of a toss up, right? Four letter words. Yeah, yeah, I like to work. But, uh, so yesterday was the uh, the anniversary of, of Dad passing. And, um, Nancy regretted that she didn't have a family reunion on that day. Yeah, but I tell you, I'm so glad that she uh, went to go see Joanne and spent some yeah. time there. I mean, that that's important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, something that she probably would never have gotten to do if Dad was here. If you don't fly. Because he don't fly. <laughs> he, flew, he flew when he left, but <laughs> he, flew, he flew out of here. Uh, so yesterday, well, just this whole last week, I've, I've um, been pondering father-son relationship, you know. And um, so that's why we're going to be in this chapter. Um, it is this parable. So it's not a true story. It's a, it's a story that Jesus used to uh, to convey some things uh, of what we call the prodigal son. I don't really like that title. Uh, I mean, I know that's what he was. He was a prodigal, but it kind of only focuses on him. Uh, so there's much more in this story uh, than just the one kid that decided to live crazy and, and do wild things. <clears throat> What's up, man? You just rolled out of bed. See, there you go. <laughs> I can tell. All right, so let's have a word of prayer. And um, then Josiah is going to do some music. So, Father, Lord, just uh, come to you and ask you to just bless this time and just uh, teach us some things from your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather. Um, there's places in this world where people cannot. So we have that freedom, Lord. Uh, we thank you for that. 
bless your word in Jesus name Amen Well <coughs> should put my cough drop in a little sooner yeah, well. yeah. All right <clears throat> I've done this song here before and uh, I uh, felt it fitting to do it again especially since mom wasn't here because it makes her cry but um, <clears throat> since uh, yesterday was the anniversary of dad moving out on her <laughs> and moving in with Jesus I always get people's attention yep a year ago today my dad moved out on my mom like <laughs> what <laughs> yeah he moved in with Jesus like I hate you <laughs> shock and awe I love it but um it's a Casting Crowns song called Scars in Heaven. So, uh, a little bit. I did get my sense of humor from him. Most of the time it's not funny. <laughs> If I had only known the last time would be the last time I would have put off all the things I had to do I would have stayed a little longer Held on a little tighter Now what i get for one more day with you There's a wound here in my heart where something's missing And they tell me that it's gonna heal with time And I know you're in a place where all your wounds have been erased And knowing yours are here, the seal in mine the only scars in heaven They all belong to me and you There'll be no such thing as broken And the old will be made new And the thought that makes me smile Even as the tears fall down Is that the only scars in heaven Are on the hands that hold you now I know the road you walked was anything but easy you picked up your share of scars along the way But now you're standing in the sun You fought your fight and your race is run The pain is all a million miles away The only scars in heaven They all belong to me and you There'll be no such thing as broken And all the old will be made new And the thought that makes me smile now Even as the tears fall down Is that the only scars in heaven On the hands that hold you now Oh, hallelujah 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 On the hands that hold you now
to you You live on and on in the bitter parts of me Until I'm standing with you in the sun I'll fight this fight in this race I'll run Until I finally see what you can see There'll be no such thing as broken And the old will be made new In the thought that makes me smile now Even as the tears fall down That the only scores in heaven On the hands that hold you now. Okay. <laughs> I told myself I wouldn't wouldn't cry. He had to play that song. Sorry. <laughs> you know, we all we all come, uh, we, or we go through life, and we, we pick up we pick up our own baggage, I guess you could say. You know, we all have a journey, and uh, sometimes it's tough. Some of our journeys have been tougher than others. Um, And even after we come to Christ, that that road that we walk can um, can lend us to moments of doubt. Uh, can lend us to <coughs> setbacks. You know, we can we can find ourselves thinking things or maybe even doing things that we thought we had escaped. You know, life is life is difficult. You know, it is. And, um, I'm just thankful that the Lord is um, He's faithful when we're not. You know, He's there. And uh, I don't understand His His um, His ways. You know, the Bible tells us that His thoughts are not our thoughts and His ways are not our ways. And it's uh, sometimes very puzzling why He does things the way He does. You know, on December the 19th of 1971, my dad and I, we left California, and um, I was uh, four, four years old, and we were broke. Um, he, all the money he had, he bought bus tickets for us, and we, we went to Las Cruces, New Mexico, and... Um, Stayed with a family member for a few days, and then we made our way from there down to uh, to Brownsville, Texas. And um, my dad had recently become a Christian, but he was running he was running from his past at the same time. And um, we we lived in Brownsville, Texas, for about a year, and then after that, we uh, we made our way up to uh, Nacogdoches. That wasn't supposed to be our final destination, but that's where we ended up. And uh, by then it was early 1973, I guess. And then he uh, he met uh, Nancy, my mom, uh, or stepmom, but she's mom, um, in the last few days of July, I guess, of uh, 73. They got married 12 days later. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so much for a long courtship, but they had a long marriage, right? <laughs> so, so you know, uh, 
and you just, you just never know, you know. So we, I, I tell you that to just tell you, you know, God took a guy from California who was running from his past. He, he, and no matter where he tried to detour, he got him to a place where he could use him. And uh, he, he, he being my dad, um, uh, he was not perfect by by any stretch of the means. He just wasn't okay. Um, but the one thing that that he knew is that he had a father in God. He knew that. And every time he would would mess up, he would go back to the Lord and say, hey, messed up. Uh, he dedicated his life to being used by the Lord. And, you know, it's funny, Josiah and I, when we had that conversation a couple month or a month or so ago with somebody on Facebook, and this person said, you know, I've got these degrees, and I've done this, and I've done that. And my first thought was, my dad is dead. He's in heaven, and he's still helping people. He's still helping hundreds of people today, and he's gone. See, that's the kind of legacy that, that I, as a Christian, I want to leave that whatever I did didn't just stop when I left, but that it continued in the, in the lives of somebody else. See, only God can really can really do that and, and make what you do worthwhile, you know, for eternity. Um, so as I was just thinking this week, you know, um, about the father-son. See, there's a father-son relationship that I have with my earthly father, but there's a father-son relationship I have with my heavenly father. And the one thing that I learned, and I'm still learning, but really have learned over the last year, is um, that it's okay if my earthly father is not here because my heavenly father is always here. He's always here. He's always guiding and and correcting because I'm not perfect either. As a matter of fact, I'm probably worse than my dad. I, I mean, that's the way I look at it, you know. I, I just I, I see it that way. But I know that I have a Heavenly Father who's faithful to me. Um, and that's what this story points out. So we're going to read in, in this and we'll go back and, and look at some of it in uh, Luke chapter 15. We'll start in verse 11. And it's a familiar story, so we probably all have heard it at some point. And he said, and this is Jesus speaking, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. It means he partied a, a lot. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father... I have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell upon his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no longer worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this is my son who is dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now the elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called unto the servants and asked 
what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and he would not go in. Uh, therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said unto the father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, or you didn't even give me a small goat is what that means, that I might uh, make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hast devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was uh, meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. So a little bit of background, just to, to set the understanding for this. Uh, we live in a very uh, <coughs> different society than where this story came from. Uh, the society we live in is an uh, extremely individualistic society. And um, what happened in this story carries so much more weight than it would in today's time, okay? Now, we can't even really understand it at all, but we'll, we'll, we'll try. Um, we even have an expectation kind of in our society that, well, you know, Kids will be kids, boys will be boys, uh, you know, you go off to college, you sow your wild oats, you party, you do those kind of things, and then after a while, you know, you come to your senses and you find somebody uh, and you settle down and you have this great, wonderful, perfect life and you do all the things that you were supposed to do when you were out doing the things that you weren't supposed to do. That's the way our society works. That's how people think. Well... First of all, all that is a bunch of garbage, even though people think like that. That's not the way it should be, okay? Because just FYI, we we're all adults. We all probably, well, some of us, we're all adults. Even you, okay? <laughs> we're all adults. Look, you can make decisions today, and 10 years from now, those decisions have consequences. So it's, it's, it's a farce to think I can go out when I'm, 18, 19, 20, 22, and do whatever, and then by the time I'm 30, all oh, that's just going to be gone, and I can just do what I need to do now. And, and, and Look, come on. The past haunts us. Right? I mean, it's just the truth. We make decisions that have choices, and those choices have consequences, and those can last for decades and sometimes a lifetime. So, we, the only way to get through some of that is uh, really to, to, to come to Christ and he'll make us a new person. And then in doing so, we'll have to have a lot of self-talk uh, where we um, remind ourselves of who we are and not who we used to be. Uh, there is an easier way. It's just do the right thing from the beginning then you'll have to have those conversations with yourself, right? But that's probably not where we are, right? Well, in this culture, going out and, and doing whatever you wanted to do between the ages of 18 and 25, that, that was not accepted. See, th their society is a shame and honor society. The father was the patriarch of that family. Um, you did what honored the family. You did what was best for the family. You did what brought honor to your dad. If the dad passed away, the older brother would have become the patriarch. You would have done the things that brought honor to that brother and to that family. In that society, um, the father's possessions would have passed to the oldest son. That's the way they did it. Uh, the younger son might have gotten a small portion, but whatever land, whatever money, what cattle, all that would have passed to that oldest son and that status and that honor that he had within that community would have passed to him too. So this younger son comes and says, hey dad, give me what's mine. And I want us to understand 
the gravity of this this conversation that, that, that really took place. In order for the dad to give to the younger son what was his, he really at that point had to divide what belonged to the younger son and the older son. And he, he lost a part of his patriarchness. I'm going to make up a word. Okay? Because the younger son would have, I mean, the older son would have already basically inherited. Okay? They would have had like a, a mutual ownership of what was left. Okay? Um, but what is the son really saying? Is, is what's important. He's not just saying, give me what's mine. Um, he's what he's really saying is I don't really want you to be my dad anymore. I don't really love you for who you are as my father. I just want what I can get from you. You see, you see what he's saying? Just give me what's mine and I'm out of here. And he turned his back on his family and he went to another country and he uh, wasted it all, right? Um, so he goes and he, he, it's just like the Lord, you know, the Lord lets us get to the end of our rope, lets us get broke, lets us get broke down, lets us get desperate. We're in a foreign place. We're the outcast. It's like that, uh, there's a song by Zach Brown Band. He's talking about when he's in Mexico. He said, the senoritas don't care when there's no more dinero. <laughs> right? So when the money runs out, you don't have any friends. Right? He, he was so, so hungry, he wanted to eat what the pigs ate. He said nobody would give him any, anything. Right? So he starts to have some conversations with himself, and he goes, man, this is crazy. I need to go home. He said, even my dad's servants have, they're doing better than I am. So he's thinking right. He is, to a, to a degree, okay? And we're going to talk about that in a second. He's thinking right to a degree because he's coming to his senses, and he's saying, hey, I did the wrong thing, and I need to go back, I need to go back to my dad, Right? We know the story. He went back, right? Well, let's talk about the dad for a moment. It says that the dad saw the son when he was still afar off and he went to him. Now let's think about this for a moment. <clears throat> the average parent in our society, if they gave their kid a bunch of money and the kid went and wasted all that money and then the kid came back home, what would the parent think? Why are they coming back? to get more money. That is exactly what that parent would think. That's what I would think, right? Oh, you want, you, you want more. You want more than you were allo uh, uh, allotted. You, you, you want some now of what your, what your brother has, what was left over for your brother. You want his money now, right? But see, the father went and met the son and he didn't even bring that up, did he? No. And the son said, hey, I don't even deserve to be your son. I want to pay you back. And what does the father say? You don't get to pay me back. That's not an option. Most parents would have said, okay, well, we're going to work out a plan. <laughs> okay. I had a daughter one time. She ran up a phone bill. It was like $1,000 in one month. She paid it back. Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> that was a little bit different. But uh, but the dad said, no, that's not an option. He said, you come back. He said, and I'm not going to welcome you as a servant. I'm going to welcome you as a son. And that is actually very amazing. Because, see, what the religions of the world tell us to do, the religions of the world say, do the best you can so that God will accept you. 
but not Christianity. Christianity, and what Christ is teaching us right here, is he did everything he wasn't supposed to do. And the father loved him anyway. And the father loved him as a son, and he accepted him as a son. And he said, no, you don't get to pay me back. Uh Uh-uh. That is what my dad realized many, many, many years ago. That he had a father in God that loved him. And that's what he taught us. Now I went, I was like that prodigal guy. You know, I went every which way I could away from the church. As as long as I could. Until I ran out of road. Okay. And then I realized, oh, God loves me. He's there for me. He's been there for me. So then, let's talk about this oldest son, though. See, a lot of people want to focus just on the fact that the younger son did these wrong things, that the younger son only wanted what the father had instead of wanting to have a relationship with the father. But the older son was no different. The older son was no different at all. Now, he didn't leave. But he still really only wanted from the father in his father's things. He said, oh, well, dad, you know, I've, I've always done what you told me to do. I've never left. I never squandered your money. And you haven't given me anything. He's complaining. Because really what he was doing, let's be honest, he was waiting for his dad to die. <laughs> right? That's exactly, he was waiting for his dad to die so he could be 100% completely in charge of everything without having to have his dad looking over his shoulder. That's what he was doing. See, in human relationships, we tend to do things like that. And what's sad is that there's a lot of people that want to have a relationship with God like that. They pray for God to do things or they pray for God to give things or they pray for God to take away things when what we really need to do is just be happy with the fact that we have a relationship with God. See, the more we have a relationship with God, the more we love God and the more we allow Him to love us, those other things don't matter. Those, it doesn't matter if I have or I don't have. That's what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4. He says, whether I've been abased or I abound, he said, I've found, I've learned, is what he said, I've learned to be content in any situation. Because what he found is he found a love that he had with God, that he shared with God, and God was enough. And when he was, and when Paul was getting beat, and Paul was getting whipped with the cat of nine tails, and when Paul was hungry and starved and in a prison where he was under the prison, in the sewage, probably waist or even maybe neck high. That's how they did it. He was there and he was still singing hymns and praising the Lord and preaching to the, um, uh, to the, to the guards because he understood that God was enough, that God was sufficient. Paul's the one that said, God has supplied all my needs according to his riches and glory. Let's think about a guy says God has supplied all my needs according to my riches and glory. And yet he was beaten and yet he was whipped and he was starved. He was left out in the ocean to drown. But God supplied all his needs. Well, what do you need when you have everything in God? See, everything else is just extra. And most of the time, most everything else is just a distraction from what we really need. I said this, I think, probably last time I was here, but I'll say it again. I was talking to a guy years ago who was in my office because he had slid his wrists. And he, the blood was starting to dry up, and he just told me, he said, you know, to, I just want to lay down and die. And I I'd had no idea what I was even going to say to this guy. And these words just came out of my mouth, and I just looked at him and said, well, today's the best day of your life. And he stood, because his head was like this, he looked up at me. I said, yeah. Because until you get to the end of you, you have no need for God. That was Mark. 
See, we have to get to the end of us so that we can really understand how much God loves us. Because if we don't, what happens is we just try to manipulate God. Yep. Has anybody ever done this? Well, God, if you will do this for me, I will live the rest of my life for you, Lord. Anybody ever done that? Come on now. Because I don't did it like a lot of times. I know I'm not the only one. Like, Lord, if you would just like... Lord, my light bill is due. Can if you would just give me the money, Lord, Lord, I will I will preach the gospel. <laughs> as soon as my light bill's paid, I turn the TV on and forgot all about the Lord. <laughs> right? That's what we do. But God doesn't bargain with us, huh? I don't bargain with terrorists. <laughs> if you, oh, you know how many times? Do you know how many times I've been driving down the road and I see the lottery sign, two point five million? I'm like, or whatever it is, you know, two hundred million, like. Lord, you know how many people I could help with that money? <laughs> <laughs> right? Now I'm praying, Lord, whoever wins, help them give it to the Lord. Yeah, help yeah, them give them, yeah. Because he's probably not going to let me win. So, um, but here's what's interesting about this story to me. Uh, he's talking to, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, right? Pharisees, um, they thought that they would go to heaven and that the prostitutes and the tax collectors, well, they just called them sinners, but they were tax, they, like the tax collector was, was the worst person in their society, okay? Because they, like, they were like the strong arm of the mafia and whatever they could get from you above and beyond what you owed, they got to keep. So they were hated, right? So the Pharisees were looking at those people, like they're, they're just going to go They'll never get to go to heaven. But we, we're good people and we're going to get to go to heaven. The problem is, is these Pharisees were like this older brother. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to earn their way into heaven. And they were trying to say, well, God, you owe me. Just like the, old, the older brother was saying to the dad, you, you, you should have at least given me like a goat. I've done everything that I could have some so a fun time with my friends that you owe this to me. God doesn't owe us anything. Doesn't doesn't owe us. He loves us. Um, but what really, when you take this story, now we're going to kind of shift gears from this story. So let's talk about Christ. Because see, Christ is the true older brother. And what happens is, this young, the younger brother comes home. And let's just say the younger brother is us. It represents us, okay? And we're lost. And we come to this relationship with God the Father. We, in that moment, what happens is the love of God is extended to us. And as the Father, in this story, he gave the son a robe which was a place of prestige. He gave him a ring. It wasn't just a ring. It was the family crest. It was the seal that they would do business with. Okay? This had extreme meaning. Okay? And he had a feast for his son. Well, what is a feast? Especially in older times, but even 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 today, I know when my wife and I first started dating, I asked her to go to dinner, and she said no. Because she said, dinner with somebody that's an intimate thing we're going to have to have some conversations before before we get to dinner see the what was going on back then is that dinner was a very intimate time the dinners back then would last for hours and hours and people would would come you'd invite people and everybody that's where people got to know each other they didn't have facebook so they had to get to know each other by talking to each other right and it was intimate and it meant that when you're invited to dinner, you're, invi you're in the circle of the family. So what happened here is there was a supper. It was called the Last Supper. And it was a very intimate time with Christ and his disciples. But it wasn't just Christ and his disciples. Because if you remember what's happening in Christ's mind, at this dinner and at the Garden of Gethsemane, who is Christ praying for? He's praying for us. Okay? 
Because he wanted us to be a part of his family. And he wanted to clothe us like that robe that the father put on that son. He, God the Father, wants to clothe us in the blood of Christ. To shield us from the world. And he puts a seal on us. He puts his own seal on us. He says, you are no, when we come to Christ, he says, you're no longer your own. He said, you were purchased. You were bought with a price. The work that I begin in you, I will finish. If you have, it says in 2 Corinthians, it says, if any man become a new, or comes to Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone. They're new. He says, I'm going to take out the heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. Because see, the, the lost heart is a heart of stone. It's one that's not, um, Respondent, It doesn't respond to the love of God. Because Christ is the true older brother. And what happened in this story is when, when the father gave the son the robe and the ring and the food, who did he take that from? Those were the possessions of the younger son. I mean, of the older son. They belong to him because that was his portion that was left. So when we come to God the Father, it's at the expense of Jesus Christ. We can't go to him and say, man, I remember this guy. This guy's name was Joe. I can't remember his last name. But uh, um, I was talking to him. I was at the Nacogdoches Mission. I know exactly where I was standing. I was talking to him. I said, Joe, when are you going to turn your life over to the Lord? And he said, man, he said, he said uh, you know, I got this place for the for God, but you know I got this other place for me and other things. But I just I got to clean my sins up. I, I got to clean myself up so so God will be you know happy with me. It's impossible. No power. Good, good, yeah, right. One, no power, but two, we're not just talking about um, behavioral, uh, you know, get, getting better in your behavior. Look. The worst sins that we ever commit are where? Uh-huh. I not kill people in my head. Let's be honest, right? I've been like, man, oh yeah, don't don't get me started on traffic. <laughs> that might happen today. <laughs> Ooh, we can have all kind of terrible things of thoughts in our head about people. And the Bible tells us that God looks at the heart he looks at the heart of man see there's a story uh that says it's this pharisee and he goes to the, to the temple and he's praying and there's a like a beggar guy a poor guy and he's praying and the beggar's like he wouldn't even lift up his head he's just like beating on his chest you know lord you know i'm a sinner i'm, I'm, I'm. and this other guy he's saying oh well you know he's like looking up probably got his hands up well lord Thank you that I'm not like this guy. Well, his thoughts, God, God's judging his thoughts. He, he might have nice clothes. He might not be a, a murderer or a liar or an adulterer, all those kind of things. But he was full of pride. And God doesn't look at pride. He abhors pride. See, in order for us to have a relationship with God, we have to humble ourselves. This younger son had to humble himself before the father. And when he did, the father said, I see your humility. You don't get to pay for anything. I accept you as my son. Bring you back at the expense of your brother. Now this brother didn't want that expense. He didn't want to, to pay for his brother's mistakes. But Christ does. It says in Hebrews, it says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. See, Christ wants... You know, I've been thinking a lot about... I'm going to kind of veer off for a second here. <clears throat> Christ wants to have a loving relationship with us, right? So... I've had people propose this question to me, and then I've heard this question proposed to other people, just you know, in random, that well, why did God even create us? 
like it doesn't it show that he had a lack of something like he needed something like he wasn't self-sufficient or, or or totally at peace if he created us so what we we tend to un, uh, not understand is that before time God existed in a Trinitarian Godhead where there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now the religions of the world will tell you that that doesn't exist, that there is a God, but it's just one. Or they'll say there's multiple gods, okay? Christianity is unique in the fact that there's one God that exists in three persons, which means... Let's understand something about what that means as it applies to love. If there was only one God and he had no, no, uh, not, not a Trinitarian God, but just a one single being, right? Then that would mean that love was something that was created and didn't pre-exist before creation. What happened with this Trinitarian Godhead, whether it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is they existed in perfect love with one another. And when he, God created us, He didn't create us because He needed love. He created us because He wanted to share love. He wanted to give love. Just like this Father. He wanted to give love. He was waiting for the opportunity to give love to His Son. He just needed His Son to get out of the pig pen. And come home. Then he could love him. And it's the same with us. God is looking for opportunities to love us. Have you ever heard the saying that some people are difficult to love? We all heard that, right? Well, newsflash. We are all difficult <laughs> when it comes to the love situation. Because here's why. We are like the younger son in the fact that we think that we need to do something to earn that love. See, that younger son, he was saying to himself, man, if I could just get back and I can work this off, at some point I will feel worthy enough for him to be my dad again. But see, the thing is that with us in Christ is that it's an infinite debt. And we can't pay that off. We, just, we can't work hard enough and we can't work long enough. What we have to do is we have to not be so difficult to receive love and to humble ourselves and accept that love. I know I have these moments in my own life where I think things, sometimes I say things, and then I have to go back and take my foot out of my mouth and wonder, why did I say that? And then I back up a step from there and says, because you were thinking that. Well, why was I thinking that? Because <laughs> I wasn't thinking on the right things. I wasn't really pondering and meditating and enjoying that love relationship that I have with God. I was being selfish. That's really the only, that's the other side of the coin. And it's easy to be selfish. very easy to be selfish. And it feels good to be selfish. Right? No, it does feel good to be selfish. Well, it feels good in the moment. I'm like, man, I can't wait till they all leave. I can watch this movie. I gotta hear no voices. You know, I can eat what I want to eat. I can sleep when I want to sleep. And, you know, this movie might be two hours long. It might take me four hours. I'm gonna keep taking naps. But I'll be, I just want, sometimes I just want just everything to be about me, Right? Well, this is the truth. I mean, let's just be honest. Sometimes that's the way we are. I'm glad Christ wasn't that way. I'm glad that Christ said, you know what? When I get through this journey that I've got to go through, I'm going to be able to enjoy loving relationships with those who I paid a price for. Yeah, this is not going to feel good. We know it, it didn't feel good for Christ to go to the cross. See, what did he tell us? He, he told them at the Garden of Gethsemane when they came, the soldiers came, he's, and Peter cut off the 
the ear of the, high, uh, the servant of the high priest. He said, what, what are you doing? He said, don't you know, I can call like 12 legions of angels to come down here and rescue me. You see, if he wanted to be selfish, he could have done it that way. He could have said, these people are not worth it. The people that I am, I want to be in a relationship and, and show love to are the very people that are killing me. He could have said, that's not worth it. But he didn't do that. I'm glad. I don't know about, about you all, but I'm glad. Okay? Um, I'm thankful that he's clothed me in righteousness, even though I'm not righteous. See, I think about this story because I overthink things. I think, man, he put a coat on this guy. Did he give him a bath first? <laughs> I mean, I think about that, right? Did he take a shower first? But see, the truth is that this is that I'm not a good person. There are no good people. But I'm clothed in the righteousness of God. He didn't go get me and make me perfect. And then when I was clean and perfect, then he put a, a robe of righteousness on me. No, he put a righteous, robe of righteousness over the dirtiness. So that when people look, and not even necessarily people, but when God the Father looks, he sees the righteousness of Christ. He says, oh, he's got, he's got my son's robe on. Oh, he's got my son's seal of approval on. Huh. Uh, I'm not going to go into this, but I do think it's it's interesting that when Moses went to the burning bush, what did the what did the Lord say? He said, "Take off your shoes, because this is holy ground." Yet this father put shoes on him. These are different kind of shoes. I want some holy shoes. Well. Not holy. <laughs> right? Look, this... <clears throat> this story to me is, is quite amazing just because uh, it shows to me that um, anything that I have is a blessing in life and in, in my eternity with, with, with the Lord... Um, is at the expense of someone else. Is at the expense of Christ. Not a lot of people in life. Sometimes someone will, but most times people don't. They don't put their life on the line for you. That's just the truth. You know, I spent almost nine years in the military, and um, I was deployed. I used to think when I was younger, I used to think. I'll put my life on the line for for for, uh, for my country. Put my life on the line for for my fellow Americans. And in some sense, yes, you know, maybe in some sense. The truth is, I needed a job, okay. <laughs> and my job said you're going to go to Iraq, and that's I just did my job, right? That's just really. It's not the same as you know someone saying, um, you know, I. I'm going to shoot her or I'm going to shoot you if you'll take her place. That's not the same thing. Christ said, look, they're not going to die for their sins. I'm going to die for their sins. That's amazing to me. I don't know if that's amazing to you. If you've ever been in combat, it, it might make more sense to you. But let me ask you this as we close. Are you willing, because I don't know, I don't know, and I don't, I don't mean this in, a very, in any condescending way, so don't, please don't take it the wrong way, okay? Because I don't know your personal lives. Everybody in this room might be a Christian. Hope you are. But if you're not, let me ask you this. Are you willing to give up working in the pigsty to come home to your father? Who loves you? Who's waiting? Who's who's been watching far off and said, "Oh, here he comes! I'm going to clothe him in a robe of righteousness. I'm going to put my seal upon him. I'm going to bring him back into the fold." Are you willing to do that? And if you are a Christian, we all have those moments where we tend to think 
on the pigsty way too much. Sometimes we become nostalgic about the pigsty or what led up to the pigsty, right? Well, I remember I was, remember when I was hanging out with my buddies, man, I drink a case of beer every day. We become, we become nostalgic about those things. We do. We get in those groups of people, those friends, they all start sharing stories and we want to we wanna be a part of them. And we, oh yeah, I used to do this and I used to do that. But if we're honest, where did it lead us? It led us to emptiness. It led us to a place where we were homesick for something that we knew was better out there. So we don't need to become nostalgic about sin. Matter of fact, the best thing to do, my advice, this is free, but I think it's good advice, is when those kind of conversations start up, just go do something else. Don't be a part of that conversation. It happens to me at work all the time. They start these conversations and I just think, I guess I got to go out in the unit and check some pressures or turn some valves. I need to, I don't need to be here because I like to tell stories too. And I like to be a part of the group. And I, I, I can real easily get into that situation where I'm being nostalgic about the things that I used to do. But the things that I used to do belong to a person that I used to be who I am no longer. So the best thing to do is sometimes just relieve yourself from the situation. I hope this uh, makes some sense to you. Uh, maybe you think about this. Think about the one thing I guess I would hope that each one of us would think about is that what we have in Christ, what we have in our relationship was given to us at the expense of someone else. That should birth in us more gratitude than we've ever had. We should reflect on that all the time so that that gratitude can grow, so that we can grow and then be um, a great reflection of who Christ has uh, called us to be. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your love for us and that your love is um, it's a perfect love. It's a love that was not created in time and space, but it existed before we were even here. It's a love that, it's not an if-then love. If we do this and if we do that, then you'll love us. But it is um, an agape love. It's a love that you want to um, extend to us, to let it permeate through us, to change us, to bring us into the right relationship with you that you've asked us um, and shown us that, that is possible. Lord, I pray that when we have moments, when we do think about the past, uh, that we would not dwell on the unworthiness of it uh, as much as we would dwell upon the fact that when we are in Christ, we are new creations. And that's a truth, it's a fact, it's a promise. And that we can live moving forward um, with a positive hopefulness, with a, a purpose and a peace that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.